Welcome to Live Free. I'm Angela K. Austin. Together, we'll discuss books, we'll explore the world, and we'll do it with some of my closest friends. And hopefully, we'll make new ones along the way. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Angela K. Austin, and I'm here with my friend Pepper Pace. Hey, Pepper, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. As you guys know, this is all about diversity in writing. And I wanted to invite my friend Pepper because of a long time ago, I read a book called Beast, a modern day fairy tale. And if you haven't read Beast, I don't know why, because it's got like, what, 7 million reviews on it. But, you know, you need to get in line with the rest of us. Um, But Beast struck me. Be struck me because of the people that the story was about. They were these imperfect people in so many different ways, not just in the physical way, but also emotionally they were going through or struggling with different things about themselves. They didn't feel whole or complete, you know? I would even say maybe they didn't even quite like themselves or love themselves, you know? So when I read the story, it struck me. You know, because I think there's so many people, there's so many of us out there in the world for real who just do not love ourselves. Every time we look in a mirror, we see something that we don't like. Instead of seeing the good things, you know, it's like this scar or that scar or because I was once this or once that, we don't forgive ourselves. We don't like ourselves. And so we don't think that we're worthy of the good things. We don't think we're worthy of love. And that's how Beast struck me. It was these two people who, when I read the story, I just didn't feel like they thought they were worthy. And so I wanted to invite Pepper here to talk with us about who she is, about her writing. And, you know, I wanted to get some more detail about Beast. Like, is there a Beast too? What's happening? (laughs) Well, um, (laughs) Beast is the uh, one story that I've written that probably people know the most about me, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about Beast. So it is about a young man who has a facial deformity. He was born with it. And when I wrote this book, I wanted to write the story of a reverse Beauty and the Beast. And I wanted to do an urban version of it. And when I say reverse, I wanted to make a beast, like if you've ever read or watched Beauty and the Beast and you see how lovely this man is, even through his anger. But I thought, what if the woman is actually the beast and he is the beauty, even though he has this cranial facial deformity? So that was the reason for writing that story. But as it turned out, um, even though I made him so deformed, Unlike a lot of books that I read where there was just a little scar, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you want to write a story where there's just this person feels very, you know, not comfortable with that small scar. But what if your face was so deformed that you frightened people, that you had to stay in hiding? So I wanted to explore that. And I was surprised to find that so many people thought that this beast, this male character... Uh, who was a a Marine, uh, was so beautiful. I made him a vulnerable alpha. And then when it came to the love interest, she is like so many of us. She has her own vulnerabilities. Um, She was what I called a fluffy girl. So she's a big, beautiful woman, but she was unable to see her own beauty. You know, being a bigger size woman, so many people you know, your face is so pretty, but you'd be so much prettier if you lost weight. I even faced that as a bigger woman. So I wanted to explore that. And then instead of her understanding, you know, that people shouldn't be judged in that way, she judged other people. So that made her kind of beastly. She, she wasn't, you know, the epitome of the uh, the hero. As a matter of fact, I got some reviews where people said, I don't like Ashley. She doesn't deserve the beast, but it's all about the transformation. So that's what beast is about, that whole arc, that transformation to these people becoming 
who they really would have been if they didn't have the outside world influencing how they saw themselves. Now that is, I, I love the way you said that because, you know, as I, I think back on some of the stuff that, you know, that Beast did, you know, there, you know, and not to give away any of the story for people who have not read this, but, you know, just some of the, the things that he did in general when he really didn't even know her, but still trying to help her in different ways, you know. Um, I mean, I just thought, you know, it's so easy for us to see someone in need or somebody who, you know, just whatever, and for us to ignore them and focus on ourselves, but he didn't, you know, and, and like you said, her, you know, one of her, one of the times I remember when she reacted to seeing his face, you know, it was just like, you you know what I mean? Like that initial kind of like taken aback, but, but, you know, like how easy is it that for any of us that if we've been judged by certain things for so long, how easy is it for us to then internalize that and to judge others the same way? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things that I really wanted to explore. And so much of my writing is about exploring my own thoughts, my own feelings or things that I see. Um, I know a lot of times people just want to kind of follow what a trend is. And it definitely is not a trend to write a story about a man who is deformed or a person who has um, a disability or is in a wheelchair. But these are the concepts that I want to explore. So when I focused on Ashley and uh, the fact that she had so much insecurity and so much self-hatred, uh, but she really focused on glamour and, you know, she had to have the contact lenses and the, you know, dyed, kept her makeup on and hair dyed a certain way and went with a man who was absolutely gorgeous, but who cheated on her. And, you know, I won't go into details about all the things that he did. I think a lot of it, like you said, Angela, it's about society. It's about how people make you feel. So once those two found each other, they were able to, I guess, kind of lean on each other and then just focus on each other without worrying about their friends. Because, you know, people around them, even uh, Christopher, his family didn't always see eye to eye with his decisions. Her friends didn't always see eye to eye. So uh, you just have to, I think that that's reality right there. I think you're right, because if we if we look at ourselves, you know, that circle of influence, who is in it, you know, and how much weight do they carry when it comes to us and the decisions that we make about ourselves and our lives, you know, so no. So I think you're absolutely right. And I wanted to circle back to something that you said is about you when you write these stories, it's about, you know, you kind of exploring things that you're curious about yourself. And oddly enough, that same thing is something that um, Bridget Midway said to me. It's even something that, you know, Michelle Prince hinted to. And it's something that I talk about in my own writing is a lot of the things that a lot of the stories I'm telling are, um, they're based on things that I'm curious about and I want to explore because of things that have, you know, I may have seen in my own life, you know, I may have experienced in my own life, you know, and I want to take it and try to pick it apart to see what possibilities, you know, there might be and what lies underneath, you know, that's kind of why I tell some of the stories that I tell just this whole thing about exploring things. So, you know, you said something earlier about vulnerable alpha Mm -hmm. And so I want to circle back to that, too, because so many things that people, you know, that you read out there now, you know, of course, it's, you know, alpha male, alpha male, alpha male. But that vulnerability aspect, in in my opinion, you did it in a different way because, you know, people always kind of have that thing where they want to be like, you know, there has to be this redemption quality. You have to give them something that people, you know, X, Y, Z, yada, yada, that they can latch on to and like about that person. Kind of what you just said about Ashley, how people didn't like her. They wanted him to have someone else, you know? Right, right. But um, you, you did, you know, with Beast, I mean, just such a great job at making him 
you know, it's like, oh man, you know, you know how people always say like good guys finish last or whatever. Mm-hmm. You made him, <laughs> you know, you yes. made him, you put him in this package, you know, I mean, body wise, you put him in this, this one package and then you gave him this other thing happening, you know, with, you know, the facial cranial thing, but then internally he had all these other things that were battling and happening with him yeah. but up underneath it all there was still this 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 um i don't know this these things that made you really love him how did yeah. you create that how were you able to do that so well well um i got to a point where i started to despise the alphas that I was reading in in so many romance books. I mean, it was always about someone who was violent, uh, violent against their mate, or or wanted to see something violent happen to their mate or to their love interest. And um, just having so much anger that was fixated toward their mate. And I know for myself, I'm not dating that guy because if before we start getting together, if you're showing signs of aggression toward me and then after we get together, you know, I'm going to be like, well, gee, you saw that coming. So I kind of wanted to go in a, in a different way. Now there was absolutely times when he was angry at her, but I never felt like she thought that she had to fear that, you know, he might, do something to her. So I got to a point where I was just so tired of seeing that same rehashed alpha idea. And I felt like you can be an alpha that absolutely loves and protects the people in your uh, circle. Yes. Yes, you can. (laughs) That is what Beast is about. He is about, you know, I'm going to hurt you if you hurt the people that I care about. And the people I care about, it's not just my woman, my children, if they had children, my, but it's my mama. You ain't going to hurt my mother. So um, that's, I think that was the whole thing about my concept of the type of alpha that I wanted to write. And as in the stories that I've written, the, the novels, the short stories, uh, you will probably see that even though I do have alphas, I don't have that same type of alpha. My alphas are even just kind of going away from beast for a little bit. I have an alpha who is, I don't even know if you wouldn't want to call him an alpha. I don't even know that I like those definitions. I have a male character who his vulnerability is the fact that he was homeless and, you know, kind of lost in his life. But when he found that woman that he loved his strength, he, you, you saw the strength was always there. You just never gave him the opportunity to show it to you. He knew it was there. He didn't feel like he needed to show anybody that. And so there was never any, dis, you know, there's no doubt that the person in that particular story, which is the story Juicy, um, where he was an, uh, a man that uh, you might want to call him an alpha, but that whole concept of alpha comes out when it needed to. So I always love the whole concept of a man that is a gentleman, maybe even a nerd, but would destroy for you. That's my idea of an alpha. Mine too, Pepper. (laughs) You know, I love, I love intelligence. (laughs) I love intelligence in my men. But, you know, but I love that you said that because that is one of the things that I see so much in a lot of books that I read where alpha is is so often equated with this kind of distant, you know, brooding, you know, um, angry, whatever kind of guy who, you know, and there's nothing wrong, you know, with that character. But, you know, it's just there was this this thing that you wrote into into this book where there was just this underlying um, you know vulnerability that was so strong you know that you could see you know his loyalty and his compassion and it, I just fell in love with it you know so um, but speaking of your other book juicy and just your writing in general you know because you you write in this space with you know 
um, big, beautiful women and, you know, these imperfect people, you know, just overall, tell us a little bit more about why you write in that space and some of the other books that you have that are in that same vein. Well, um, it started, my writing career started in a very odd way. Uh, being, I, I, you wouldn't think it if you read some of my erotica that I'm incredibly shy. At least I always have been very shy. And I would write my stories and share them online in a place called Literotica. Um, and that was just a place where you can just share stories for free. And actually, I went there to read stories because I had just discovered interracial interracial books. And I love reading. I love reading AA. I love reading what I would consider traditional books that are just with mainly white characters. I love reading horror, all different types of books. But when I went to Literotica, it was because someone said, you can read hundreds of of interracial stories for free. And reading those types of stories just kind of opened up like something inside of me that mirrored my life and writing interracial merit my life. But then I saw that, first of all, there are so many free stories out there where there are some of the most awesome writers that I've ever, ever read uh, for free. But then there were so many stories that were just so, it was just following the same type of um, tropes that I always, you know, well, I started to dislike them. The angry woman, the, you know, just the same type of things over and over and over again. So when I decided to write, I decided that I was going to write outside of the box. And that was always my goal. It wasn't because I thought that I would shock people or something like that. It was just because that's what I wanted to read. I wanted to read something that was different. You know, sometimes I do want to go back and read the same thing, you know, the the same storyline, the romantic storyline, because it's beautiful. But that's not all I wanted to write. So when I started thinking about my male characters, I thought to myself, well, what do I like? Do I like some guy to take me by my throat and choke me? Well, yeah, sometimes I do. <laughs> but, you know... I don't think that every story that I write about a man has to be about, you know, a guy that wants to choke you. So that was, I put what I liked in men into those stories, not just beast, but, um, you know, about the homeless man. Like I never thought about being attracted or falling in love with a homeless man, but one day I saw a homeless man. I mean, I saw a lot of homeless men where I worked, but I saw this homeless man sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, what is his real life? What is his love life? How does he live? How does he, you know, go about his day-to-day life? And I decided that I would explore that through story. And of course, it's always going to be a hustle. You got to be stronger. Sometimes you got to be weak. And I think that that is what, I personally like to explore in all of my stories. It would be very difficult for me to write a story in which I would follow a prescribed beginning and end. If you figure it out, like for instance, I have some beta readers that um, are really good friends of mine. If they figure out where the story is going to go, I'm done with it. I'm like, nope, not doing it. I changed the story. I don't want you to figure it out. I mean, you might know that it's going to be a happily ever after, but you're not going to know the steps that take you to that happily ever after. So I just strive. That's that's the reason that I write the alphas, the male characters, the female characters, the way that I do. You know, and I think um, that what you just said about that, about like that prescription, because, you know, so many people who are writing because they have, you know, we all have, you know, at some point entertained this idea of being picked up by larger publishers, you know, this, that, and the other, and you read what's out there and you know that this is what they want. This is what they are looking for. And so because you know that that's what they're looking for, you put that work out there and you try to write what you see is being written, you know. So 
taking that leap and creating your own path and writing stories that are different, writing stories that are unique, I think is, you know, one, you know, that's admirable because it, you're like, you're like, no, you know, I want to tell this kind of story and you're writing it and you're taking a chance, not truly knowing, you know, if it's going to land, if it's going yeah. to reach someone. But I think that that's really what we, you know, as creatives, that's really like one of the things that we should be doing. You know, we should be writing these things that open up people's minds, that take them in a different direction, you know, show them something that they may not have seen before. I don't know. I I love that you're doing that because that's, you know, again, that's something that, you know, that I've tried to do and other people that I've, I've interviewed. I think that's something that everyone is trying to figure out how to do in their own way, whether you're telling something that is a contemporary or historical or paranormal. The whole thing is, is that you're trying to figure out how to tell a story that is unique. The fact that, you know, if a story, if your beta readers figure out your story, you like walk away and toss it or redo it. I remember something a long time ago uh, from a writing class I had, and they were like, you know, as you're writing, you know, you you write down these different things and like the first thing that pops into your head, you know, when you're outlining or you're developing that story, you should walk away from like the first two or three things because uh-huh. those are the things that everyone is going to think of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds about right. You know, so yeah. you have to go down your list by the time you get to thing number six, seven, or 20. You mm-hmm. know, there you go. Because that's the thing that the next person, even if it might be on their list, it may not have been at the top of their list. So they may not have you know, thought about it as quickly. You know, yeah. so I love that you're doing that. Um, yeah. Okay, so there's another set uh, there's another series I know you have, and you're going to have to remind me of the name of it. I know your hero in that story. Is is he a paraplegic? Can you tell us oh, about that? Okay. Well, I am writing currently um, a series called Wheels of Steel. And Wheels of Steel is the story of a man who has cerebral palsy. And he, uh, in the beginning, is in a wheelchair. And um, he's a ginger. So I always want to write about ginger. And how this love story came across is because I have a friend who has cerebral palsy and I actually met him online. Um, He actually was one of my readers and he said to me, you know, I'm in a wheelchair and it's hard to find erotica. Uh, It's even hard to find romance, but it's really hard to find erotica with people who have any type of handicap. And I said, oh, that's a good concept. And I said, you know what? I said, and I didn't know he had cerebral palsy. I knew he was in a wheelchair, but I didn't know he had cerebral palsy. So I said, you know what? Let's let's uh, do that, and we're going to have him have cerebral palsy. So my friend kind of gave me a crash course in what it is to be a person that is trapped in a body that doesn't always want to do what you want to do. And he owns. He's an artist. He's a DJ. He owns his own corporation. So having cerebral palsy doesn't mean that you have any type of mental disability. Any type of disabilities that you have typically are just based on you being able to control your muscles and your body. So I took this whole concept of just any other man. I wrote the story as if he was just any other man. He has his bad. He has his good. He's you know, sometimes he's, you know, a very negative person. And then I told you, oh yeah, by the way, he has cerebral palsy. By the time you realized that, you know, he was really this person, you had already saw the human in him. You didn't just see a person with a handicap. And I think that that is what made uh, Wheels of Steel so popular is because we saw this young man, Jason, who when I really went into detail about what his cerebral palsy meant, it meant seizures. It meant that you can understand what he was saying sometimes. It meant that his muscles, his head flopped, his muscles, the food might fall out of his mouth. When I described that, it just showed you, it just made you want to pull in deeper and find out more about it. And then the love interest was a shy girl who was so paranoid about um, a learning disability that she had as a child, that she was incredibly shy, was hard for her to meet anybody. Eventually, it shows that 
your disabilities are not visible, not necessarily visible. She was just as handicapped or disabled as anybody else who had a physical disability. So I just like to kind of flip things around. And that's the one that I, so Wheels of Steel is a ongoing series that I've been writing since I think 2000, was it 2012, 2010, but whatever it was, 2012, I think. And I'm on book five of that. And right now, if someone is interested in reading this book, I've created a machinima. Now, I don't know if you know what a machinima is. It is... Um, I do it, not. I've never heard that term before. What is that? All right. Well, machinima is a, uh, it's a movie from a game called Sims. So I am a huge fan of The Sims 4. And I play it like, especially now, <laughs> with uh, not being able to work or, you know, being at home all the time. So I've been playing Sims 4 a lot, and I've been watching Sims movies where people take the characters, put them in poses, and create a movie out of it. And since I've written books, I decided to act my Sims characters into movies. So if you don't want to invest in like this five book story, you can watch my machinima. I'm on part six, I think, as of this recording, probably six or seven. And um, it's on my YouTube channel. I have two YouTube channels. Um, but it will be on my author's YouTube channel. It's easy to find. You can just pull up Sims for Pepper Pace, and then you can get an idea of whether or not you would like to read a story like this. Now, see, <laughs> that... <laughs> okay, so I just... Okay, one, I think I just aged myself. Two, I just let the world know that I'm not a gamer. <laughs> <laughs> I just did all kinds of things in that one little comment about what is a machinima. Okay. I think that's such a cool thing um, to do, to be able to tell the story of your characters. And, you know, of course, as, you know, indie authors and stuff, such a, a, in a unique way to be able to reach a new audience to, you know, let them know about the work that you have out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's another way to promote, but it's um, also for me, more importantly, it's a way to create. So sometimes I'm just not in the mood to write um, a story, but I still want to be creative. And so here's another way to retell that story. Sometimes I'll do readings. uh, Sometimes I'll create um, trailers, book trailers. And right now I'm doing these, uh, and they're getting popular. People are like, when's the next episode coming out? So even as we were talking, I got a text from someone saying, I just saw your last one. When's your next one? I just kind of, especially as an independent author, where, and this is kind of going back to what we were talking about before, as an independent author, I feel like I have so much opportunity to do my own thing. And yeah, I would love to be published by big publishing house. But more importantly, the reason why I create is so that I can tell the stories that I want to tell. And that's what I kind of want to encourage indie authors to do. Yeah, I could probably have, I do have a following and make uh, people who like what I like, but could I have a bigger following if I wrote more mainstream, traditional, traditional stories? Yeah, I could. But would I be as happy? No. So that's why I say, you know, if your goal is to get with that big publishing house, then learn the terms, learn, you know, everything that you need to learn about being an author so that you can do that. But that has not been my goal. And I certainly started out writing. I didn't know that you had a certain amount of beats in a story and that this is the part where the climax comes in and this is what... I was just writing the story the way I would want it to flow if I was reading it. So that's my thing. It's like, uh, guys, have fun with writing. Don't make it like you're going to go crazy if you don't, you know, get the following. Did you like the book? If you don't even like the book, (laughs) if you wouldn't read the book, then why would somebody else like it? Like what you write. Exactly. Now, this is very, very true, mm-hmm. you know, and I've talked about this with, with other indie authors before, you know, and, and it's like we were saying before, you're 
we're all kind of exploring things that interest us and telling these stories that one we see are missing you know we're, things that you know we want to explore and so if you are an indie author you know or curious about jumping into that pool with the rest of us you know what is it that you are curious about what is it that you want to write about what stories do you want to tell and you know like you just said pepper if you don't like the story you know why are you writing it you know exactly. are you writing it because you see that it's a popular trope exactly. well, and if that's the case then you know I, I guess you're writing it because you want to make that you know you want to make that you know Two ninety nine, four ninety nine, five ninety nine, you know, twelve ninety nine, whatever it is, you know. But the the thing about it is that you know tropes do, you know, ebb and flow, you know. So right. if you're not writing something that you love, something that you really care about, if you're just looking for the popular trope, you're going to be jumping all around the place, you know. And you know, then you won't have a platform, you won't have a brand. Right. Um, that people, you know, that people will know you for, you know, so you do have to figure out, you know, what your reason for creating is, you know, I, at least I believe you do. I, I agree with you on that. I mean, definitely um, people, our readers are smart people. They'll see that you're just following the bandwagon. Don't follow the bandwagon. I mean, you can be inspired by a story. You can be inspired by, I never lived a BDSM lifestyle, but I wanted to write a BDSM book. So I wrote a BDSM book. You know, I think that is, that's what it's all about. And that's why being an indie author uh, gives me the opportunity to do what I want to do. But I tried um, to be published and I had to turn away from it because when they got the book, uh, so I wrote this book called Urban Vampire. And it's a story about a black woman. Most of my stories are about black women, almost all of them, because I write interracial where for me, interracial is a black woman with a man of a different culture. So in the series, uh, my vampire uh, has five, uh, has three love interests. And they were like, no, you can't do that romance stories, maybe erotica, but romance stories can't have the main character sleep with anybody else. And I was like, no, my character does. And they're like, well, can you just wrap them all up to be one character? I'm like, okay, no, bye. Yeah, no. <laughs> can we change? Yeah, can we change the name? I was like, first of all, you got to understand, I'm already in book three. I think this is like a five book series. It's like, I'm already in book three and I have a following. I can't just rewrite the first three books so that I could be with you guys. So I was like, no, I, I don't want to do this. I just do it for myself. I give you credit for that because, you know, that is a hard thing to walk away from. Yeah. You know, to have that opportunity sitting on the table in front of you and all you have to do is, you know, change the hair type. <laughs> <laughs> that person have to be from that country or can it be from this country yeah if they asked for the small things like that i could have i could have did that but they wanted me to wipe out three main that was the whole purpose of the story so for me um her freedom to be sexualized that was her choice if she want to sleep with three different men before she decides on the man that she fell in love with then that was her decision to make. And I don't think that someone else should be able to say that nobody else would appreciate that. I don't think that these people really, they, so um, at that time, so this was probably in 2015, 2014, something like that. At that time, I believe that they really did not recognize the importance of indie authors. Now, now they do, and they understand that readers want to see untraditional things, which they were getting more from, from the indie author. So now they probably would allow me to, cause like I write for a company now that they don't tell me anything. They just like give it to us <laughs> and we'll put they and they publish like all over the world, like China, things like that. So it's like a subscription service. So they're just like, give it to us because whatever niche you have, somebody wants you in that niche. And that's what I, I just kind of, 
I feel comfortable writing for my niche people. And that's true. You know, some, some, and some niches are smaller than others, you know, yeah. that's the thing. There <laughs> is, you know, there is an audience out there for whatever someone's passion or someone's love is, you know, and there are voices, there are people who are looking for someone who is writing what it is that they want to read. Yes. You know, I had that, um, I had that conversation with Bridget Midway about the work that she does within that BDSM environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and like you just said about your friend who had cerebral palsy, you know, that, you know, he couldn't find stuff that he wanted to read. You know, Mm -hmm. I just think that you have to be passionate about it and you have to stay true to it because if you do start hopping all over the place, you know, and you're just trying to jump onto these different, you know, hot, points, you know, yeah. then, then you will get lost, you yeah. know, so I do like the fact that you have found, you know, you know, your niche, you found it, and you write so well within it that you pull other people into it, because like I said, with Beast, I can't even, I can't even, I don't even know how many people are like, you need to read Beast, you should read Beast, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, like I said, you know, and mind you, I read this book years and years and years ago, but, mm-hmm. you know, when, you know, as I was making out this list of people, I was like, yeah, I've got to talk to Pepper because, you know, of this, of this niche that you write with them, you know, yeah. I thought it was something that, because so often, you know, I write in that world of women's fiction and romance. In the women's fiction world, you will see some of these things where there's like these, Im, you know, imperfect kind of people, because that's a little bit about, you know, the women's fiction world they will touch on all of that. Whatever is a part of that woman's journey within a women's fiction book, you know, in that world, you can touch on those things and it's not so necessarily taboo, but in that romance world, so often because it's almost like a dream state, there are a lot of things that, you know, people don't necessarily touch upon, which I think, you know, like you, I write primarily, you know, stories about African-American women, right? Mm -hmm. And so even that, just think about the number of different publishers who had imprints that were supposed to be these imprints for, you know, African-American women. But think about how many of them, those imprints no longer exist, you know? And so it's like, it's again, it's that thing. It's like African-American women read, you know, (laughs) we read a lot, (laughs) you know? So it's like, why is it that, you know, these things are not readily, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of books out there about black women, you know, but they're not, there are not a lot of new voices, yeah. I guess is what I'm saying, that are strong voices where you can just, you know, walk into, you know, stores and you just see all of these books by these new voices. Exactly. You know, there's like one or two, you know, there's a report. What is it? What is that survey that's done? Um, is it the Ripped Bodice? There's, there's a report um, that goes out that's, that used to be done like every year um, where um, they would reach out to all of the major publishing houses and ask them how many books they had that were about people of color that were written by people of color. And I'll have to pull up that survey because I used to have it saved on my computer so I could readily refer to it. But, yeah. but they would talk about you know, they would show you just how many books there were available that were written by people of color, you know, that had a central character that was a person of color, you know, and that was, it was, it was not a huge number. It was a very small percentage of the overall books that were put out on an annual basis by major publishers. And so, that's where that space for independent authors, you know, that space is wide open for all of us to jump into that arena and, you know, and write these stories that have, you know, these unique stories with these unique voices to reach out to people who are looking for something different to read. Right. I mean, it's like what you said about the woman's fiction. I tried, I, I thought about, you know, 
because I, I really have a hard time trying to fit into a, spe- a specific description or category. But all of my stories always end up to be romance anyway. So I have to call myself a romance writer. But I have to remember, because there's certain there are certain rules that you do kind of have to follow, but it's just not the same rules that everybody wants to kind of lock you into. I mean, so the romance does have to make that person, your reader, feel as if they are being carried away into a fairy tale. So that's my storytelling. I have to pull you in and take you on this journey you know, and then I have to make you fall in love with this character, with whichever character it may be, whether it's the male or the female, that's up to you. But that's my goal. So when you're writing women's fiction, what is it that, and that's what I can't, you know, because I I always read, I always end up going to romance. What is it that we are trying to achieve in that story when we're looking at women's fiction in in general for women's fiction and 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 like you 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 have this issue of you know you swing over to the romance more heavily whereas yeah. i swing over to whatever that woman's story is more heavily yeah. so the romance because i do like to I like to write stories that show that women can have love and that is not to be in that cheesy kind of on their terms way, but that they can have this and they can have that. Not to say, oh, everybody can have everything, but that you can have it in a specific way. So in women's fiction, the story focuses so heavily on that woman that the man may not be that romance or love thread may Mm -hmm. not be introduced at the top of that story. You may go halfway through that book, like that's going to be her love interest. Then, you know, you know, I may introduce another guy, you know, but, Oh, wait a minute. That may be her love interest. Oh, wait, wait a minute. How, who is going to be her love interest? (laughs) You know, because I'm, developing the woman so for me when I think about women's fiction it's about my character has to be at a certain place in her development in her love for herself before she's wholly able to love somebody else so Mm. she's usually not focused on that loving someone else because she's still trying to figure out at least my women are. (laughs) My women are still trying to figure out how to love themselves before they can love that next person. Okay. So it won't necessarily open, unless I write a story and I have not, I have not written one yet that I can think of. Sadly, I'm like, wait, have I already done this? But unless I write a story where the, when the book opens, they are already a couple. Mm -hmm. Um, But for the most part, when my stories open, I'm introducing you to the woman at some point in her life where, you know, I used to refer to my women as broken women, you know, where, and, and and now I have a book that I'm writing that's coming out that's called broken road. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. I used to always say that, you know, my characters are, are these broken characters who are stronger because they were broken, you know, and now that they have picked themselves up and put themselves back together again, they won't break in that same way again. Right. So, oh, so like my women are, so the, the love part, you know, because I like to tell that story will be in my books, but it's not on every page of my book. You know, it's not from the opening page. So like you had that publisher that, you know, you were working with and they wanted you to rewrite those, um, those first three books a lot of the time yeah you know what I've heard from publishers is that you know that literally they're like you don't write romance you know you write women's fiction and I'm like do do, do I so when I first (laughs) started you know when I first started writing and I would submit to publishing houses I would submit to romance publishing houses and one by one they would be like oh you don't write romance you write women's fiction And so I had to dig more into an understanding and learn what women's fiction was. And so, like I just told people not to do, I tried to write romance in a traditional way. But it wasn't a story that 
felt comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could write a story that was just, I don't know, that was just straight romance from the very beginning. I, I haven't, I haven't been able to, I haven't figured out a story yet that I wanted to write in that way. Maybe that's what yeah. I should say. So yeah. all of my stories, they start out with that, um, I don't know, with that learning curve, that, that awakening or something. And so, and then I go from there and, you know, then my characters, you know, come into that, that understanding of, their relationship and of that love and then they you know develop that loyalty and then they develop that relationship and that you know so that's kind of how I define it it's really more about the woman's journey and a part of her journey could be love could be romance so it won't be on every page so for all of you out there who pick up an Angela K. Austin book (laughs) be forewarned (laughs) (laughs) This is yeah. what I do. I just want you to know. But um, I like that, Angela. I like how you said that if you try to write in a specific genre, it just doesn't flow right for you. And and I get I think that's basically what I'm trying to say is that when I'm writing outside of the box, it's because I that's that's the flow that I get. I don't try to make it this or try to make it that. Um, and, and I have a hard time understanding what these other genres really mean, like the contemporary, the women's fiction. Uh, you know, I it's hard for me to really, because I'm like, isn't that a part of every story? <laughs> you know, I mean, I do yeah. have that. I mean, I have romance, but I, I understand that basically my stories are geared it's geared toward the romance to the uh, to the end of the story when they finally, you know, get together or have the hookup. So I, I guess I can understand that of it. But yeah, I I, I don't think that oh, I would yeah. ever be able to really say that I want to write only in a specific genre. I mean, I've been writing sci-fi. I've been writing. Uh, horror I've been writing erotica I've been writing romance and I think I've written women's fiction because I wrote stories that where my beta reader said there was no romance I'm like oh, there was no ro-. the la- the this last book that I this last story that I've written had no romance it's called escaping Jonathan Hightower and I got to the end and people thought I think people thought that there would be romance, but no, by the title, it was about escaping this person. So, yeah. So I kind of like that whole idea of understanding, you know, what these genres are, but just writing. You know what, Angela, I got to ask you a question. Uh Have you ever pushed yourself to write something that would be totally difficult, totally different than anything. Uh, have you ever tried to back yourself into a corner and write your way out of it? Oh yeah, yeah. I got a lot of stories that have not. Um, I'm working on an urban fiction piece right now, which is not my wheelhouse. I am, like I said, women's fiction, and in the romance world even though I have done some historical, you know, I tend to do contemporary fiction, contemporary romance, which aligns itself so well with women's fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I'm working on an urban fiction piece right now, which is so different for me because the characterization is so outside of my norm because, you know, I tend to write a lot of stories, you know, you and I were talking earlier that are set within corporate environments, even, you know, my women own businesses, you know, all kinds of things. And so, you know, changing some of that, not to say that people in in urban stories aren't business owners or anything like that, but the story that I'm writing is in a different kind of world. And Mm -hmm. so it's just, yeah, I haven't been able to get very far on it because I keep stopping because I think I keep losing the voice and I, you know, I revert back into you know, the type of woman that I like to write, Yeah. you know, which is, you know, a certain type of woman, you know? And so I have to go back and I have to dig back in. I have to, and even, um, 
I did um, I did Phoenix Daniels Cage Chronicles. Yeah. And even that because it was a short story. And when I gave it to Phoenix, she was like, you know, you should expand this. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I was like, that's what you got right now, girl. Maybe in about five years, I'll circle back and see what a girl can do with it. But, uh, you know, I don't tend to write, um, you know, anywhere re- remotely near, at least I don't, you know, see it as such erotica. Now, I can write some graphic sex scenes. I can write sensually, you know, but I don't really my sex scenes are so, you know, in my opinion, woven into the relationship and what's happening in that relationship. So the sex that they're having is reflecting, you know, where they are in their relationship. So how graphic it is or how sensual it is or how quick it is or how it doesn't exist at all is all a reflection of what's happening with those people. So when she asked me to be in Cage Chronicles, I was like, ooh, girl, this is what what's happening? What is this? This is a, a, a sex what now? What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I did one of the stories for Cage, uh, but I don't think mine ever got released. So I'm like, oh, thank God. I know she was working <laughs> on another one because I was, I'm going to tell you though, because I, I told Bridget this because when I wrote it, I was like, oh yeah, I'll just, you know, let me do this and do this. And then, you know, Phoenix kicked it back to me and was like, you can't put that in there. And I was like, what do you mean? This is a a sex club. Can't you put everything in here in a sex club? And she was like, no, that would not happen. And I was like, what? So, you know, it was, you know, one of those things where, and I even titled it, I think I titled it like something new. (laughs) Oh, okay. <laughs> because I had to write it in my wheelhouse. You yeah. know, she wasn't going to walk up in the sex club and be some sort of dom. She don't know what she's doing. I put, so I, you know, wrote it from that perspective, you mm-hmm. know, and it was like, so I still had to take it and shape it to my voice, but it was a hard thing for me to to really figure out how to write because I've never written a story that was remotely in this whole sex club kind of lifestyle and things like that. So So you did push yourself. Yeah. That's, that's the whole exercise. That's the whole thing about making yourself a better writer is just push yourself to do something hard. And my, when I, the one that I did for Phoenix was not easy because it was short and I don't, I feel like I need a long time to develop the characters so that you can either like them or dislike them. So when you're writing something short and you got to just kind of like get to the sex, it was like, I'm not used to just doing that. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think I was, a lot of people wrote it cause, um, wrote not a lot, but I think some people wrote longer pieces because of what you said, but yeah. me, because I was like, this is not my wheelhouse. I'll give you these 3000 words. Here you go. Boom. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because it was like for me to explore in that new space, you know, I wanted to keep it tight and make it as, you know, as interesting, but as kind of teasing as I could make it and make it fit into that world, you know? Right. And so I enjoyed it. It was, it was hard for me to write. I don't think, I mean, I swear to you, it, I think I, it was only like maybe three or 4,000 words, maybe five. I don't even know, but it took me forever to write that, you know? <laughs> it was like one of the hardest things I've ever written. But, you know, even like with um, the upcoming event, um, well, I think it's pushed to next year now, but we're still doing the releases for Kasana's event for the interracial um, romance author expo, That's IRAE, fun. you know, so we're, we're all still trying to do those books, but... Yeah. Like you said, you're used to writing longer pieces. That piece is, I think we're only shooting for like 30,000 words. And for me, you know, now that I, you know, I write these longer books, I mean, like so many people, I started out with poetry and all kinds of other things. But generally speaking, my books now will be about, you know, that 70, 80,000 words. So to write a story in 30,000 words, that's about like a third of a book that I would write right now. (laughs) You know, that's hard. It's hard. It is like, how do you, 
introduce characters, make people care about them, make people care about their relationship in 30,000 words. Exactly. You know? it's, it's hard, hard. to do. You, that shows your talent right there when you can do that. But I've read them. I've read books where they were like 25,000, 30,000, a complete story, very good, very well thought out. I'm like, how did they do that? I don't know how they do that. So I warn people when I put those out, I'm like, this is a, this is a HFN. <laughs> This is it. happily for now, people. This is not an ever after situation. Uh-huh. There is always going to be more story that you can tell. You know, if it is a, for me, if it's a, a short story, 25,000, 30,000 words, there's always going to be more story that I can tell, you mm-hmm. know, so it can't be anything but an HFN for me. But, um, okay. But no, I've tried. I've tried pushing myself. So if I ever get that urban fiction story out there, you know, Pepper, you'll know because I've been I love grinding urban. over that sucker for like two years. Oh and I, my God. I, I love, I, I, I want to know. Chapter. I want to read that. Oh I no. Chapter. I hope you finish it. <laughs> I love urban fiction. It's just hard to find urban fiction that has the elements that I want. I mean, I, I want urban fiction that is still sweet does that make sense okay so i read i read a so okay so i read a story by donald goines back when i was a, a young girl probably too young to be reading donald goines and it was called black girl lost and it was about this poor girl who had um you know she was neglected uh very poor lived in the ghetto but she found this balloon of cocaine <laughs> So she was like, uh, I'm going to sell this. So she went. That was her first thought. I'm going to sell it. Okay. Yes. She had to, <laughs> she was, she had to learn how to cut it so she can sell it so that she can make some money. Cause she needed to get herself and her family out of this bad situation. So she went to school and there was this boy at school and he looked like an ape that they described him. Donald Goins described him as looking like an ape, very unattractive, slow in the sense that, you know, he was not picking up in school. Uh, I don't know if that's the term that we would say now, but back then that's how he would be described. And um, he was not attractive at all. And their love story blew me out of the water. They became a kingpin couple. Now, yeah, you couldn't probably write that same story now because they were under 18, had their own apartment. I mean, from that balloon of cocaine. What? So that is this type of street fiction lit, street lit that I like. It was just so beautiful about how she learned to she taught him to trust her, uh, their love story, her not caring. I don't care about the way you look. I just care about the fact that you are able to take care of us. I mean, because he was, a, you mess with her, you do not want to mess with her. So it was good. Y'all should go read that. Black Girl Lost by Donald Black Girl Lost. Now, now I'm going to have to go find it. But now I will give you that though. That's, and I think that that's actually one of the reasons I wanted to try to write this book that I have one chapter of, but um, because I admire the hustle. Mm -hmm. I love the loyalty. Yes. You know, and I love the sense of like family. I don't care what story it is, you know, but when you talk about street lit or urban fiction, those are the things that jump off the page to me. Yeah. It's like, there is straight like, this is my family. How dare you touch my family? <laughs> you know, how you not loyal to the family? What's happening? Right. How you not loyal? You right. know, and, you know, and love is love. And people who, who try to jump in and mess up those things, take things away from it, thing, you know, people who try to destroy it, it's like, oh, I see, we need to check you. <laughs> right, we need that's to put you in your place. That's it. That's because the you mess focus. up with the family. That is know? the focus. That's what I, I love, love about that, too. That's what yeah. I like to write and try to capture in my street lit. And that's what I'm looking for in a street lit story. That's like. Exactly. Uh, that's like the mob stories, you know, that's their own version of street lit. So, Hey, I love that. 
I do too. And that's why when I decided to write this, I was like, <sighs> but because of the fact that I do want to be true to it, you know, I have been taking my time, but I have been looking at the life stories or the trajectories of people who came from that world and where they are now. And so it's wow. given me confidence in the story that I'm shaping because it's following the arc of some of those lives. Yes. You know, so I'm feeling better about it, but it just takes me a long time to write it because I can't, you know, I have to delve into it and I'm not trying to make it stereotypical. So I'm trying to make it real. I'm trying to make it fit what I need it to fit, you know? So eh, it might take me another three more years. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all right it, uh, there's no rush to get to the end of it just make it perfect for you you know that's the beauty of being an indie author absolutely. the deadline is mine i want absolutely. the product to be real I want it as to long as you don't tell your readers about it and then they start asking you where's the where's it gonna come out when's it gonna happen look like, so for oh. all of those who are listening to this podcast <laughs> yeah you know what <laughs> we get there um so this conversation <laughs> has been so fun for me pepper and i want to say thank you for being here with me but now before we close this bad boy out i want to just briefly quickly talk about your youtube channels because you know oh, okay. i started one as well and you know i'm always trying to figure out like tell us about your youtube channels i know you have your tell me what it's called again your sim it's called a machinima Machinima, see? Uh huh. So, <laughs> tell, us, tell us about because I know the um, your cooking channel because, like I said, I've looked at that one a few times. So, tell us about your YouTube channels, and you know, and then of course, you know, as always, tell us about how we can find you on social media itself. Well, um, I'm actually on Instagram. I'm on Twitter, uh, although I'm most active on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on YouTube. I have two YouTube channels. Uh, one is just dedicated to my writing and to my stories. So that is my author's, um, my official author's YouTube channel. And if you type in Pepper Pace in YouTube, you will come up with something where you can just click on my name and then there you go. Uh, please subscribe because, <laughs> you know, it would be so nice to grow my channel. You know, but subscribe yeah, my, and like. And, and, like. and like it and like. And because that helps. If you like it, even if you don't just subscribe, just like it. Just like or it. Or comment. You can yeah. comment. If you yeah. don't like it, just comment. Thank you. I mean, because I know people are viewing some of the things, but they're not commenting or liking. And so therefore I won't get suggested, you know, if someone says, Hey, I want to see a, a, a book trailer that deals with interracial or black authors, or, you know, I'm putting the keywords in there. So you guys, if you type in Pepper Pace in YouTube, you'll find that particular channel. And that one deals with uh, videos. I make, like, if you want to see more about Beast, uh, I have a Beast trailer. Beast is also on a um, audiobook. So I have, um, you know, like a preview of the audiobook on Beast. So uh, then also I have my other channel, which is my food channel because I happen to like mukbangs. So if you don't know, mukbang is where you eat <laughs> and talk. Sometimes you talk, but you eat on camera. So if you don't like watching people eat on camera, you don't have to watch the mukbang, but definitely take a look at my soul food channel uh, because on that cooking channel, I also have soul food cooking tutorials and, um, you know, so I, I I sit here and I tell Angela that I'm so shy, but if you go to my YouTube channels and you listen to me talk and whatever, you would never think that. So I hope you guys. It still feels like a family a on YouTube though, because it does. you're filming it, you're, you know, yourself with, you know, whoever's around you. So every time I put up, you know, a YouTube video, I'm like, it feels like I'm just sharing it with, you know, with family, you know, it feels like I'm Absolutely. talking to family because the people who have subscribed to you, the people who are liking your, your, you know, your, your various episodes, they are people who've chosen to subscribe and who are waiting, right. you know, so it does, it makes you more comfortable. It feels like you're talking to friends and family. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So be a part of my family, people, and Angela, because I didn't know until today that she had a YouTube channel. So I've already subscribed and I'm already getting ready to, after our, after we have our discussion, I'm getting ready to go stalk her YouTube page. Hey, I like stalkers. <laughs> go ahead. You know, like I said, I've already been hovering around your soul food channel because I told you I'm from Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, something pops up into my feed and it's about food and it's about soul food, I'm like, ah, you know, let yeah. me check this out. Happy Gotta about watch talk it. about food. So I'm like, come on. Gotta watch it. <laughs> Got to. Got to. So yeah. we can find you on Instagram. We can find you on YouTube. I'm going to go check out this machinima so I can uh-huh. at least try to say the word right. Good Lord. Uh-huh. It's like um, machine and cinema mixed together. That's yes. crazy. Yes. Oh, my God. I aged myself. About oh, uh, let me just say the machinima is for adults only, even though it's got these cartoon looking char- characters. Uh, there is actual sex in there. And I'm talking there's about sex in a machinima. Oh, my teeth. Yeah. Let me find. I was like, yes, I'm there's so out of it. I don't real even. sex <laughs> in there, y'all. So be forewarned. I do have a warning on there, not for children. So, but yeah, if you, and maybe that will interest you to look at the machinima. So it's called, <laughs> it's called Wheels of Steel to Sims. Part one, two, three, four, five, six. I think I'm up to six, seven episodes now. Wow. I, I don't even know. I'm speechless. I will, I will have to find this because it's just, it's so wild how much, you know, every time I do one of these podcasts, I learn about something new and cool and different that someone is doing, yeah. you know? And so I, I love it. I can't wait to find it, honestly. So... All right. So all of the people out there in podcast land, thank you for joining me and Pepper Pace today. And as always, I hope that you enjoyed this conversation and I hope that you will do like me and go and find Pepper on YouTube and like and subscribe and make it happen. I hope you'll find her on Instagram. And if I can do one more shout out for Beast, if you have not read it, I hope that you will go and grab it because it's fantastic. And then Aww. reach out and let us know if you read that because like I said, it really was something that I've not forget- forgotten and it's been years since I read that book. So again, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the shout out. Ah, oh, man, it was my pleasure. I, I enjoyed this conversation so much. And everybody out there, I hope that you will come back and join me again soon on Live Free. Follow me on YouTube, find me on social media, and I will talk to you all again soon. <laughs>